This is the Monday, August 3rd, 2015 pilot of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Standing alone, I saw Georgie Cone somewhere on Long Acre Square. Crowds passed him by, I heard Georgie sigh, nobody noticed him there. I asked him why he didn't smile, he said in that old Cohen style, Oh, New York ain't New York anymore, how I miss those old pals of mine. Hello and welcome. This is the History Author Show. Have you ever felt a rush of nostalgia when reading about the way things used to be? Maybe it's a time you weren't even alive. Maybe it's streets and places and people you never met. If so, then you've come to the right place. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and the song you're hearing is New York Ain't New York Anymore, a forgotten Jazz Age classic. Of course, no city or town is what it was in years past. But since Gotham is the center of the publishing world, and this is a show about books, I thought that this tune fit our theme just right. With millions of hours of content at your fingertips, I want to thank you for lending the History Author Show your ears. You can find it on iHeartRadio, subscribe with podcast aggregators like iTunes, or stream the audio at our website, historyauthor.com. We're coming to you today from our time machine high above Radio City Music Hall in Midtown Manhattan a time machine powered not by a flux capacitor, but by a fantastic slate of authors and their stories. That brings us to the voice you'll hear next, Stephen Bedford. Stephen is imprint marketing manager for publishing legend Simon & Schuster, specializing in U.S. history and current events. You can follow him on Twitter at Simon Books. I got an alert from him just a moment ago that one of their books is now on the bestseller list, which is great. And you can follow me, incidentally, at History Dean. Stephen, thank you for joining me on iHeartRadio to kick off the very first History Author Show. Well, thank you very much for having me, Dean. It's an honor to be here and an honor to be guest number one of this exciting endeavor. And it's nice to actually meet in a formal studio in the air conditioning and shade rather than being drenched in the sun and the humidity as we have met in the past. So... Again, pleasure to be here. And I have to give a shout out to my producer today, Allie, because she came in even though she's feeling under the weather. So thank you, Allie. Feel better soon. Stephen, I want to start with a question that is so common, it's a cliche. Have you read any good books lately? Well, just one or two, to be honest. But actually, it's been quite a summer for us and quite a a 2015. We published some really great history books from legends like David McCullough. And as you mentioned earlier, just had another one, which we're going to talk about in a few moments, that is going to debut on the bestseller list. So it's been an exciting time and great to see people still taking an interest and being passionate about history of all kinds, whether it's U.S. history or ancient civilization or history of science, whatever you're into. If somebody wants to write that great American novel or a nonfiction book, I'm sure people ask you all the time, like, well, how does that happen? How, how does a book happen that it ends up in front of you or next to you there on the subway? It's a long process, no? It is a very long process uh, from start to finish, and I'm not sure any book's journey to the shelf is going to be the same. Uh, it really starts with an idea. It starts with the research. It starts with a lot of discipline to just sit down and actually write the thing. And then you have to get into pitching it to the right agent and having that rapport and that chemistry with the agent, with an editor to develop the story, to winnow away the extra, to really focus in on the themes and personalities and characters and situations you want to bring to life. It's really a many many step process. And like I said, a lot of it is just going to be luck and coincidence. But like you said earlier, there are are a lot of competition for our time now, and it is reassuring and and life reaffirming to see someone actually holding a book and using their leisure time to read, to learn something, and improve themselves. Yeah, and I think what you said there about the agents, a bad agent can hurt you more than a good agent can help you sometimes, because there's people out there that 
they'll ask for money up front, never pay an agent is a, is a rule that I think a lot of people don't know because they get paid when they sell basically your book uh, or they get scanned by a lot of these self-publishing houses that they'll put out a substandard product. They don't offer you editing and such. And sometimes you just have bad luck. Uh, my first agent was the Farber Literary Agency, which was a big agency. They would produced the Fantastics. They were a lovely couple. But unfortunately, the agent that covered me passed away. And that was a big setback, needless to say. She was very passionate and an advocate. And that's what you want in an agent. I, I always liken it to finding somebody to date. You want to find somebody who's going to be a good partner for you. And if you want somebody to love you and marry you, you don't want them to do it for any reason other than they're passionate about it. And that's the kind of agent you have to look for. So this is kind of part of the show early on where I wanted to peel back the veil a little. And since I have Steven here, that's the perfect person. What does an imprint marketing manager do to connect people with this magic and publish it? I think my role is trying to find the right audience for the book to connect the story and the book with the people who are going to enjoy it and appreciate it the most and hope that they themselves will then evangelize it as well. Because there is still, even in the digital age with all our different tools of getting information, there is still no stronger way of marketing, of promoting something than word of mouth by having an endorsement from a trusted friend or someone whose tastes you really respect. So it's really trying to find the right audience who's going to enjoy the book, get a lot out of it, introduce them to it, and then from there, just hope it takes on its own momentum. And that's really that question that I mentioned, read any good books lately. People really do ask that. If they see you with a book, they'll ask you if you enjoyed it. Uh, we're going to mention President James A. Garfield a little bit later. But I was on the line at the Port Authority bus terminal here in the city one day, and I happened to be reading a biography on him. And this gentleman was just in line, and he said, is that James Garfield? Because it just says Garfield. And he said, he's my great-grandfather. And that could happen anywhere. And I, I think – People who are listening probably know they have that special book. They have that special connection they made with somebody else who loved the book. And that's why the show here, first and foremost, is going to be about the authors. I'm going to sprinkle in some of the guests that we have lined up here throughout the program. Here's the first author on deck, Esther Crane. In addition to writing the popular blog Ephemeral New York under the tagline, Chronicling an Ever-Changing City Through Faded and Forgotten Artifacts, She's the author of New York City in the Gilded Age. It's a box set, a paperback book with a stack of stereoscopic photographs. Those are those side-by-side -side black and whites. And you put on the stereoscope, which comes with the box set, and you get a real feeling that you're in 3D in the Gilded Age. This would have been just amazing, as you can imagine, in a day before television or 3D movies. So you get the box set and you get that stack of photographs there compiled by Esther Crane with the help of the New York Historical Society. Here's Esther Crane reading a section from her book. The Stereoscope Craze. One way to experience this era, as many in the Gilded Age did, is through stereoscopic images. Wildly popular at the time, stereoscopic cards featured two seemingly identical images printed side by side. When viewed through a device called a stereoscope, the images became three-dimensional. The first effect of looking at a good photograph through the stereoscope is a surprise such as no painting ever produced, wrote Oliver Wendell Holmes in The Atlantic in 1859, the year he invented a handheld stereoscope that became popular with the general public. The mind feels its way into the very depths of the picture, he wrote. Millions of stereographs were produced, and stereoscopes were common in many homes. In an age before movies and TV, they brought news and entertainment to parlors and living rooms. The 50 stereographs included here span the length of the Gilded Age. They capture a post-Civil War city getting its bearings again, the growth and expansion of the urban landscape, as well as architecture, historical events, and stark street scenes. View each one through the stereoscope, and the metropolis really comes alive. The 3D photos flicker and move as if in real time, transporting you into the image. For a brief moment, Gilded Age New York is reawakened in all its glory and whimsy. Full disclosure, the Gilded Age is my favorite period of history in our fair city, and I just love Esther Crane's blog, Ephemeral New York. Now, I know you're from up Boston way, Stephen, and so is Allie. Do you have a favorite period of time there, somewhere in the past, that you'd like to travel back to in our time machine? 
Well, I think growing up in the Boston area, you can't help but have that sense of revolutionary pride within you. There's just so many landmarks around the city and around what are now the suburbs of all the great American revolutionary outposts and battle sites and buildings. And even going back before that, I spent a lot of time in middle school on a section about the Salem witch trials, which was always very fascinating to me, that fanaticism that followed around the witchcraft and all the false accusations and executions and trials and so on. Of course, it wouldn't be Massachusetts without mentioning our proud sports history as well. So uh, we take a lot of pride in that. And uh, in addition to Boston, I also lived out in Colorado for a few years and really took to learning about the Native Americans out there, particularly the Arapaho people, as well as a lot of the mountain men and all the gold claimers and uh, just a, a unique slice of history out there in the Rockies. They found that gun recently, didn't they? Resting up against a tree that had been there for 150 years. I don't think that was Colorado, although it might have been, but it was somewhere out there in the West. It's incredible to think just how vast the Rocky Mountain region is that artifacts like that can still be found. And like you said, been resting against a tree for who knows how many years and had been undiscovered as far as we know. And I'm sure there's plenty more things out there like that. It's just such a vast, wondrous area that is home to so much history that we probably haven't even found yet. Now, this is a good time for a little exposition. Stephen's resume features stints at Viking and the Book Report Network. He's also a graduate of the Denver Publishing Institute and was a bookseller at the Bookworm of Edwards in Colorado's Vale Valley. As for myself, I've written for television, radio, news, and even a cookbook, Regional Greek Cooking, which, yes, you can still purchase. I gave you a copy of it recently. They traveled the world over the centuries and brought back so many things. So that's one of the things that drew me to writing that. I realize these finer points of Spanakopita may be a little bit out of your realm, Stephen, but uh, I still wove plenty of history into it. I am constantly learning. So, <laughs> Well, you said you're going to use the book, which is good. You flipped it open and you started looking at the pictures right away and the potential recipes. So that was that's always very gratifying. It makes me feel good. I can't promise those recipes will turn out <laughs> as they do on the page or in photo or like they're supposed to, but I am willing to try. Okay. That's all I can ask is that you try. Now, I wanted to mention one other thing just because it makes you laugh, and that is that the other thing on my resume that I'm fond of saying is that I was once the centerfold of Dog Fancy Magazine. You are, you are a true Renaissance man, <laughs> a jack of all trades, and um, you know, I, I don't know that I'll ever meet anyone again who, <laughs> who can claim that. So um, yep. you know, someday maybe you can sign a centerfold for me, and I will <laughs> hang it up with the other memorabilia I've collected along the way in my, my times in New York. Yeah, I was there at Madison Square Garden for the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, shoving my Fox News mic in the face of the winner that year. We all have our 15 minutes, so <laughs> congratulations on yours. I, I don't know anyone will be able to compete with that. 15 minutes of fur, as it were. <laughs> but uh, speaking of dog shows, my degree from Rutgers University is pretty far away from history. It's in animal science. And I worked for years as a veterinary technician. But anyway, like some of the authors we'll hear from, I wanted to mention that because you realize that a love of history isn't the exclusive realm of professors in tweed jackets. It's not a dry subject. It's for everybody. Everything we do is writing history. Absolutely. I think we do get conditioned to think of history in a classroom sense or an academic sense, but really we need to have an elastic definition of history. It's every aspect of society and culture has its own history. Whatever your hobbies are, you can trace back the history of those. Wherever you're from, you can trace the history on whether it's a micro level like the town you grew up in, whether it's U.S. history. So it's all around us. It informs us. There's always that saying, those who don't learn history are condemned to repeat it. And I think we can see that across any number of facets of society. That's one reason I started reading biographies of each American president in order. There's always someone in there who flashes into the subject's life. There's that one person or multiple people or one event that – the person might not even know that they've had this effect and they might not even live to see it. It could be a person you talk to on the A train that really changes the way you look at things. Or if you're a writer, you end up writing it down and saying, let me put that person in my book. They were unique. So I wanted to ask you about that kind of experience. You ever have something like that where you sort of 
get thrown for a loop by something, it's a aha moment. Yeah, that's a, a tough one to be put on the spot about. But um, <laughs> yeah, what immediately springs to mind is uh, we mentioned earlier, I used to work in a bookstore out in Colorado's Vail Valley, and that was one of those sort of life-changing moments that really set me on a career trajectory and in different path in life from where I was treading. And it happened very innocently. I was sort of taking some time to find myself in waiting tables and not really doing a whole hell of a lot with my great education and just happened to walk into the bookstore one day looking for a new read. I hit it off with the owner and next thing you know, she mentioned that they were hiring and turned out to be a great mentor and and really set me on the path I am now. And it's really sentimental and nostalgic to look back on how it all just happened just walking through that door one day. And that was six years ago. And now here I am sitting talking to you in the heart of the publishing capital. You never know what it could be. I I saw Art Garfunkel perform a couple of weeks ago, and he wondered who it was that left the Enrico Caruso record in his house that first inspired him to sing, he said, to release the bird in my throat. And now for Garfunkel, who, by the way, I don't know if you ever looked at his website, artgarfunkel.com, but... Quite a bibliophile. (laughs) He writes down every book that he's ever read. He had music as that germ of inspiration when he heard that Enrico Caruso song. Sometimes it's a special book that changes someone's life, but often it's the reverse. The change in someone's life can lead to a book. And that brings us to the second title we're going to tease. It's The Oregon Trail by Rinker Buck. Tell us a little bit about this. And you have some breaking news here because this is a a Simon & Schuster offering. Yes, some uh, some historic news. And we're very proud to report that we just found out that The Oregon Trail is going to be a New York Times bestseller when the next list is released. A lot of people worked very hard on that. So it's very gratifying to see. And it's it's an excellent story about a great piece of Americana, a piece of history that I'm sure we're all familiar with, whether it's from history class back in elementary school or the classic video game that many of us have all played and died of dysentery along the way at some (laughs) point. Uh, But it's, again, a, a great piece of American history about the pioneers who packed up really their whole lives into mule-drawn wagons and went to go settle a a new part of America, really a new part of the world. There was not a lot of discovery out there, and it was sort of the great unknown and people trying to make a new life, a new living. And weaved into that is Rinker's own story. He sets out on the trail in a mule-drawn wagon with his brother, and he and his brother are very different people. And they rediscover not just a certain part of America, but rediscover their own relationship as well. We have a clip from Rinker Buck talking about his book, The Oregon Trail. Let's roll that now. I grew up on a farm in New Jersey. My dad was publisher of Look Magazine in in the city, and he was a pretty respectable guy all week. But on weekends, he really kicked out, and uh, we had a collection of antique wagons and horses, and later on, we built airplanes and motorcycles and stuff like that. So in 1958, my dad decided that it would be a really good idea to take us on a covered wagon trip from our farm in New Jersey to Pennsylvania. So it seemed natural to me when I became fascinated by the Oregon Trail about four or five years ago that I would take the Oregon Trail with a team of mules and a covered wagon because I'd sort of been enabled to do that by the kind of upbringing I had. We essentially jumped off for the same trip that the Pioneers took, left St. Joe in early May just like the Pioneers did. It was mesmerizing traveling the trail on what is now a road and imagining what it was like when there would be a thousand wagons in view ahead of you. My brother came along, my brother Nicholas, and without him we probably wouldn't have made it because he's a great mule driver and a great mechanic who could fix all the broken things. But we're incompatible. I consider myself sort of refined and I'm a writer and like a fine glass of wine, etc. And my brother Nick basically likes hydraulic fluid on his shirt and speaks very differently than I do. My f***ing brother's a idiot. <laughs> That's something that I had to grapple with not only personally getting across the trail with them, but then writing the book. I think what I really discovered out there is the essential goodness and decency of the American people. People were generous, they'd drive miles in their pickup just to give us hay, direct us to water, invite us to camp on their ranch. We started calling them trail family and there was this wonderful feeling during the journey of being passed from rancher to rancher to rancher and always finding a refuge in the hospitality of fellow Americans. Again, the book is The Oregon Trail by Rinker Buck. I'll look forward to swapping stories about those New Jersey farms with him. Maybe we know some of the same horses. And hopefully not some of the same sheep. (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, we talked about that before you said it. I did not know if you would go there on the air. Well, sometimes if there's a farm <laughs> joke, I think you have to make it. So <laughs> We used to say at Rutgers, Cook College, whether men are men and the sheep are nervous. <laughs> well, while lining up these guests, I thought of how people treasured books back in the days before mass media, like radio and TV and films. Abe Lincoln really would walk miles to borrow a book. Theodore Roosevelt hauled trunks full of them on safari and his ill-fated trip on the Amazon's River of Doubt. In many ways, publishing a book can be like that trip was for TR. It almost killed him. That's how it can feel to get published. It's your river of self-doubt, your personal Oregon trail you're trying to map. So tell us from the germ of that idea, if people are listening to a manuscript, to a publisher like Simon & Schuster, to the bestseller list like Rinker Buck, hopefully. How does that journey start? A lot of it's going to start with the idea and taking that idea and looking at it through the lens of what's new here? What can I bring to the story? What can I introduce? Why does it matter? Why would someone want to read this? And once you have those questions answered, maybe in pencil, not necessarily pen, and then you start outlining, mapping out your different chapters, what characters and situations you want to bring to life, how you can relate the story to someone who may not know anything about it and really make it understandable and digestible and enjoyable for whether it's an academic or an armchair historian. When you buy a book, it's an investment, not just monetarily, but an investment of your time. And there's a lot of competition for things like that with all streaming devices, with everything available at the touch of our fingers. I want to stick with that topic of how we're writing history often without ever knowing it. James Garfield, who I mentioned earlier, his father died when he was just a boy. He was very poor. They lived up by the Erie Canal. But his mother refused to let them give up, refused to let the family live in poverty. Eliza Ballou Garfield, she really pushed him. She was a tough woman, I think, to have as your mother-in-law for Lucretia Garfield. (laughs) Here's Todd Arrington of the James A. Garfield National Historic Site in Mentor, Ohio. Thanks, Dean. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to talk with you and your listeners. And, of course, we're always excited to share Garfield history with everyone. James Garfield was one of the most purely intellectual presidents we've ever had, and he was also probably one of the most qualified. He'd been a college professor and president and a state senator before the Civil War, and then a Union general during it. After 17 years in the House of Representatives, he was preparing to take a seat representing Ohio in the U.S. Senate when the Republican Party made him its compromise candidate for president in 1880. Garfield entered the White House in early 1881 with a lot of promise. Just four months later, though, deranged assassin Charles Guiteau shot Garfield in the back in a Washington, D.C. train station, and one of the most tragic and dramatic episodes in American history unfolded over the next 80 days. Numerous doctors used dirty hands and instruments to probe the president's wounds and ultimately introduced infection into his body, which finally killed him on September 19, 1881. The shooting and medical care Garfield received were covered very well in Candace Millard's Destiny of the Republic, published in 2011. Now her book is the basis for a new film set to air in January 2016 as part of the PBS American Experience series. The film is called Murder of a President, and it was made for PBS by Apograph Productions, and it does a phenomenal job of looking at Garfield's life and career and trying to examine where his presidency may have been heading when Charles Gateau shot him down. The film also examines the horrendous medical treatment the president received and looks at a number of the personalities that were around Garfield after he was shot, including Alexander Graham Bell and several others. Garfield is often called the best president we never had, and this film will really help people understand why that's really a great description. We're excited about the film here because two of our staff members were interviewed for it and appear in it, and even more importantly, it's sure to get people interested in learning more about Garfield. James A. Garfield National Historic Site saw a spike in visitation after Candace Millard's book came out in 2011, and we're expecting this documentary to do the same thing. Uh, We can't wait to welcome people here and share more about President Garfield's life and legacy. Here's a story of an assassination that few people have even heard of. And a lot of people would think, well, why do you want to tell that? One of my favorite stories, they say he was a big guy, and, and they said James Garfield's father was so big he could 
pick up a whole keg of beer and drink it out of the bunghole. You could just hold it up and drink. I said that that's such a human moment, those kinds of things. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with it on PBS. It's a great party trick too. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine how popular he would have been. <laughs> General Garfield, of course, served in the Grand Army of the Republic during the rebellion. This is Civil War historian, lecturer, and author Jane B. Singer. Here she's telling us about her book on that period, Lincoln's Secret Spy, the Civil War case that changed the future of espionage. What is worse, a Confederate con man claiming he was Lincoln's spy throughout the Civil War, or the Union war hero turned attorney who abetted his falsehood and who doggedly pursued this claim all the way to the Supreme Court, where it became a precedent that affects the legal rights of clandestine operatives to this day. Can the Totten Doctrine, as it is today known, be overturned? When William Alvin Lloyd stumbled out of the Confederacy into Washington, D.C. in May of 1865, he began the greatest fraud of his entire career, to bilk the United States government, and he succeeded. Stephen, do you see a lot of Civil War books right now? I'd, I'd imagine you would with it being 150 years since Ulysses S. Grant forced Lee's surrender. That is an area of U.S. history that people are always interested in and has such an enthusiastic readership. People always constantly wanting to learn about it, not just the, the wars, but the personalities and really debate a lot of those points as well. I, I know in cities and states across the country, there are Civil War roundtables that meet up biweekly, monthly to whether it's a book club discussion or looking at tactical maps. So there really is an entire subgenre of Civil War books at any given time. At SNS, we are the proud publishers of uh, Harold Holzer, who is recognized as the leading Lincoln scholar out there. His book, Lincoln and the Power of the Press, was recently awarded the Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize, which is very prestigious and won by the likes of Doris Kearns Goodwin and Steven Spielberg was also an honoree. So we have that one to look forward to in paperback. We're also the proud publisher of Gary Wills's Lincoln at Gettysburg, which was a Pulitzer Prize winner. And most recently, we published a beautiful bound volume courtesy of West Point, which is the definitive military history of the Civil War, which is really, I think, a Civil War enthusiast's dream companion book. It is just loaded with all sorts of visuals. The cartography is beautiful. It really lays out all the different tactical maps and strategies that the generals and the armies employed. And uh, it's really just a beautiful keepsake edition. And um, if you're into Civil War history, you, you need to have that on your desk. A lot of people were really great writers back then, and they told the story of their war in a way that the people who fought in the War of 1812, well, they didn't sit and write about it much. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great point to make is so many pivotal points in U.S. history and the development of this country uh, were documented in letters because that was the only form of communication. And uh, letters weren't just a, a postcard. They were pages long and well-written. You have people that their only reading material were all the classics and the ancient Greece philosophies, the Bible. So you get these very well-written letters that detail the entire time and period and really put you in that time and place. And a lot of people kept diaries, too. Something that doesn't happen anymore that I know of, but back then it was everyone kept their diary. They wrote their thoughts. They wrote their daily routines, their opinions, what they were up to that day, that week, whether they were a soldier, a farmer, a politician. Yeah, John Quincy Adams wrote everything. Yeah. <laughs> he would write down how the green beans were undercooked. But uh, I was going to say to you one thing to disagree with. They, people still have diaries. They just call it Facebook and put it up for the whole world. And so future generations yeah. can say, wow, my grandmother really hated Mondays and <laughs> uh, <laughs> liked the minions so yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be funny to see how our era is documented 50, 100 years from now with digital technology and email. And uh, you wonder what will happen to archives when there aren't these flowing, beautifully written letters and diaries that are just pages, pages long. It's going to be interesting to look back and read on our era, uh, the digital era, when wireless communication and shorthand and social media has just permeated every aspect of it. And uh, 
I don't know if I'm looking forward to it or not, to be honest. Well, if it makes you feel better, it'll be somebody else at Simon & Schuster publishing the book about you. So you won't have to worry about any of the promotion or <laughs> telling anyone about it. Hopefully or... <laughs> I will be uh, retired on my royalties at that point. Yeah, the great story from Vale to 6th Avenue, maybe. <laughs> but let's tease another author from another great period in New York City again. Here's a clip from Simon & Schuster's History in Five series. The book is called Supreme City, How Jazz Age Manhattan Gave Birth to Modern America, and the author is Donald L. Miller. Hi, I'm Don Miller. Today we're going to be talking about New York and the jazz age, the 1920s. Duke Ellington called Manhattan the capital of everything. In the 20s, it became suddenly and spectacularly the capital of radio, America's radio city. In 1920, there was no commercial radio in New York or anywhere else. By 1927, radio was America's newest big industry, and radio stocks were flying high on Wall Street. Two New Yorkers were behind this radio revolution, David Sarnoff and William Paley. In 1926, Sarnoff, an immigrant from Belarus, assembled the world's first radio network, NBC. A year later, Paley, a young Playboy millionaire from Philly, arrived in New York and established the second national radio network, CBS beginning a fiercely contested rivalry with Sarnoff that lasted into the 1960s. When you think of the New York sporting scene in the 1920s, you think of Babe Ruth. But 1927, the year Ruth hit his record-breaking 60 homers, heavyweight boxing was more popular than baseball, and the highest paid athlete in America was savagely aggressive Jack Dempsey, one of the most hated and revered boxers of all time. Dempsey's career was guided by a master promoter and con artist named Tex Rickard, a former sheriff from Texas cow country. Before Rickard arrived in New York in 1920 and took control of Madison Square Garden, most championship fights were held before all-male crowds in western mining town. Rickard made them big urban spectacles with ringside seats reserved for millionaires and movie stars, male and female. Women felt safe at a Rickard fight, protected by a small army of thick-necked guards, with Dempsey as his drawing card, he made boxing into big business. In Dempsey's fight against French challenger George Carpentier, the first of Rickard's unprecedented six million dollar gates, the New York Times devoted 13 pages to the fight, and young David Sarnoff, partnering with Rickard, broadcast the match to nearly half a million listeners. Radio and Rickard ushered in the age of mass spectacle sport. We're back on the History Author Show. Our guest is Stephen Bedford of Simon & Schuster. And as the saying goes, there are 8 million stories in the Naked City. Don Miller covers the best of them, Stephen. So how long did it take him? We talk about the process of research and writing. How long did it take him to pick this and edit it down to the best story of this time? I'm not sure I could fathom how long it took him in terms of a calendar, but it is so thoroughly researched and detailed and there's just so much in it. And Don is a, a relentless researcher, a, a wonderful writer, and really passionate about history. What he set out to do here was capture the city at its apex, at a crucial turning point, not just in New York history, but really U.S. history, where so many developments and personalities were changing the course of the cultural landscape. He did it previously in City of the Century about Chicago at the turn of the century. So this is sort of a companion to that. But in terms of delivering the manuscript to putting together the pages, the photo inserts, indexing, and then getting it shelf ready is probably a 10 to 12 month turnaround. And that is not factoring in all the work and travel and research Don has done over the years to really bring the roaring 20s of Manhattan to life as he does here. Yeah, I have to say, even though it may sound like I'm sucking up, I love this book. <laughs> I just, as I said before, the Gilded Age is my favorite period, but this is this is a stone's throw from there. And you can see where when you study one era and then you jump forward to one that maybe you haven't looked into quite so deeply as I have in my case, and you say, oh, here, the groundwork was laid for this. There's consolidation, for instance, in the end of the 1800s in Manhattan and Brooklyn and the Bronx and everybody gets together and it's the greater New York. But you see how that groundwork is laid. Now there's there's starting to be skyscrapers now, whereas in the Gilded Age, early in it, you had the Brooklyn Bridge that was the highest spire in the city or the highest point in the city. You and I work here in Rockefeller Center, an area that's a legacy of this transformation between the World Wars and of the Great Depression and New York 
eventually replacing London as the financial capital of the world. Outside our studio window right now, we can see the awning of Radio City and the skating rink where they light the Christmas tree every year and 30 Rock. But Supreme City paints a picture of this neighborhood's prohibition days, and they call this the speakeasy belt, something I learned just very recently. And I won't tell you where I learned it, but uh, you could probably guess. <laughs> and I learned it from a book. That's right. <laughs> How subtle. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it, it, I can't say that it was Supreme City, but it, it confirmed it for me because it was just, okay, it was a Star Trek novel. But anyway, <laughs> it was it was a good one. It was Dr. McCoy, what happens to him after the city on the edge of forever when he steps through the Guardian of Forever and changes history and the Nazis win the war. But that kind of detail, <laughs> you can find that little exciting detail and then you can look it up in a book like this that you say, okay, this is the real history. Now, now I'll find out if it is. And that is what this was. This was the speakeasy belt. Today, it's rockets and flashing lights and so many buildings. And you used to be able to, from where we're sitting now, even though we would have been in midair, you'd be able to see the spires of St. Patrick's Cathedral. When that was first built, just a block over, that was the also the highest point in New York City. You hear that term again and again, this was the highest, this was the highest, this was the highest. And I just imagine those days, everybody in this area has this sort of camaraderie that if we lived back then, we wouldn't have to hide underground and avoid tourists between Thanksgiving and New Year's, right? <laughs> it is It is a, a game unto itself uh, <laughs> for that month and a half and uh, can really aid you a few years. But I think with a book like Supreme City, it gives you a whole new appreciation of an area, even though you're in it every day. Uh, you and I are here in Rockefeller Center every day, the part of the, the city where Supreme City is primarily set. But after reading that and working with Don, I learned so much about the architecture of the buildings around here and gained such a new appreciation of them. To learn the the beginnings of the French building, the Shannon building, the Chrysler Tower just a few blocks from here, and the competition to keep building higher and design better and really make the buildings works of art, which they are, and you gain that appreciation. To learn about Death Avenue, which is now partially the High Line Park, and it used to be uh, an exposed overland train route. Um, there's just so much to learn and appreciate, and I think what Don has done and what any great historian is capable of doing is writing a book that you can carry around with you and consult with it and go to the spot and read about them and then appreciate where you're standing and how it's evolved and really see how history has changed before your eyes almost. To learn about the big personalities like Big Bill O'Dwyer and Tex Winter and Jimmy Walker, the mayor. Jimmy Walker, <laughs> Jack Dempsey. It really is a magic journey. I saw the French building when I first moved into the building next door, and I looked at the beautiful, ornate stonework at the top, and I said, why did they put that there? Forgetting that the building hadn't been there at the time with all those buildings around it. And then I open up this book, and oh, there's a picture of it in its heyday. The Jazz Age gave us radio. That brings us into the next title we're going to tease. It's Big Science, Ernest Lawrence and the Invention that Launched the Military-Industrial Complex. The author is Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Michael Hiltzik. And again, as a scientist, or at least someone who was trained in science, I don't, I don't science anymore in my free time, but I, I was interested in his take on this. Ernest Lawrence was the pioneer of big science. When he invented the cyclotron, the first great atom smasher. He started a trend toward big equipment, toward demand for money and resources that science had really not seen before. In the old days, one scientist working alone in his own laboratory could make great discoveries. In the modern age, you need big equipment, you need a lot of financial support. Ernest Lawrence was also the pioneer in knowing how to manage big science. He brought together these interdisciplinary groups physicists, chemists, biologists, medical experts who could exploit the discoveries that his cyclotron was, was making in these new fields of, of research. The military really got involved in scientific research and development during World War II, and Ernest Lawrence was an important intermediary in that process. Lawrence was one of the first scientists to recognize that the government and the military were going to be important patrons of science, research and development well into the future, even during peacetime. 
What's important about Ernest Lawrence is his legacy. It's the world we live in today, the world of high energy physics, the world of big science, the world of government participation in science. He was a pioneer in that field. He really created big science and created the method of managing big science. We wouldn't know as much about the world today if not for Ernest Lawrence. Big Science is a great book for the purposes of this show because it focuses on subjects that are rarely touched upon in print because a boring person can make an exciting subject <laughs> boring and a person who's excited about something, whatever it is, even if it's something, okay, it's a machine, cyclotron. It sounds cool, but a lot of people, they don't like the math. I'm one of those people. I don't have a math mind. And this is about a physicist. And you think about the pitch and you say, this book could never have been written if the person hadn't been passionate and said, no, I have to tell you how exciting this is and find a way to connect it to the modern times. Talk about the military industrial complex and how the state started really pouring money into the sciences and then how that ballooned later in different ways. We always said when we booked guests, be a good talker. That's why you see a lot of lawyers on TV. So because lawyers talk, they talk, talk, talk. <laughs> That's their job, right? And you have to be a good talker. You have to be persuasive and passionate. That's really a skill you have to hone as a writer with when you're working with words, isn't it? Especially because you don't have anything other than you and the book. That's exactly right. And I think what you said about passion is totally right on. I think a, a book about the cyclotron and Ernest Lawrence and the development of the military industrial complex is a, a challenging concept. But where someone like Michael really excels is communicating those challenges and concepts very clearly, which is a bit of a tongue twister, but he really brings that to life. And you can read the passion in the words and it starts to make a lot more sense. It becomes contagious. You start to see why the story matters. It's the development of modern science. It's bringing together people from different disciplines working towards one goal and how it can filter out and influence whether it's the military, whether it's the medical world, whether it's just day-to-day -day life. It was bringing together people from different backgrounds and disciplines and having them work together towards a common goal. And that is really sort of the subtext of the whole story and I think what people will take away from it. And where that all starts is how it's communicated. And someone like Michael that just knows the material, is passionate about it, and wants to communicate that to people who might not know necessarily the history of the cyclotron and Lawrence and why it is so important and how it has influenced us even today, even decades later. There's so many things that go into the marketing and design of the book and reaching that person who may be inspired when they pick up that book, and that could be the book that changes their life. But something like a bad cover or bad placement in a bookstore or not getting it out there that it even exists, it might get lost. And I thought of that as you were speaking, because I looked at the cover of that and it's inspiring. And part of the reason is, speaking of animal science, one reason a cat will come and sit on your keyboard or you say, gosh, I'm reading the newspaper, I'm reading a book. And every time I am, the cat comes and sits there. Well, why, why, why do you do that? And the reason is when you stare at something in cat language, you're saying, that's interesting to me. Come look at this. And so that's one of the things with that cover is it's people staring at a machine and a machine looks exciting. That draws me into the story right off the bat. I love that part of this book. I just loved it from the, from the cover. And I know you're not supposed to judge a book that way, but I did. Well, you, you really <laughs> can. And uh, the cover is sometimes that's your only shot to catch a reader is to have them pass by it on a shelf and have it catch the eye and get them to put the book in their hand, to flip through it, to read. And that's really how discovery happens and how people can learn and challenge themselves and, and realize they have interests they didn't know before. And, and like you said, the, the cover of Big Science is just one of many examples we could go through. But it is an enticing image of Lawrence peeking into his machine. It's an enticing image. It's an intriguing image. It makes you want to pick up and say, what is this guy looking at? What's what's on the other side of what he's looking at? And next thing you know, you're into the world of the cyclotron and big science and the development of the military industrial complex and World War II and atomic bombs and so on. Let me toss out another book 
that's on its way to your shelves. It's kind of a sneak preview. The author here is another friend of mine, Jonathan Sands. You may have heard of Jonathan's great-grandfather, the greatest Briton, William Spencer Churchill. You might not think there's much left to write about Churchill's life, but Jonathan has really done something special in his upcoming book. It's called God and Churchill, How the Great Leader's Sense of Divine Destiny Changed His Troubled World and Offers Hope for Ours. I want to tell you a bit about my exciting forthcoming book, God and Churchill, revealing compelling evidence that my great-grandfather, Sir Winston Churchill, was correct in his belief that his life, like many others, had been protected and guided by, as he put it, divine intervention. When Winston Churchill was a boy of 16, he already had a vision for his purpose in life. This country will be subjected somehow to a tremendous invasion, he said and I shall be in command of the defences of London. It will fall to me to save the capital, to save the empire. It was a most unlikely prediction. Perceived as a failure for much of his life, Churchill was the last person anyone would have expected to rise to national prominence as Prime Minister and influence the fate of the world during the Second World War. But Churchill persevered on a mission to achieve his purpose. Gordon Churchill tells the remarkable story of how one man, armed with his belief in his divine destiny, embarked on a course to save Christian civilization when Adolf Hitler and the forces of evil stood opposed. It traces the personal, political and spiritual path of one of history's greatest leaders and offers hope for our own violent and troubled times. More than a spiritual biography, God and Churchill is also a deeply personal quest to discover my great-grandfather and how finding him changed my own destiny forever. God and Churchill, published by Tyndale House, is due out on October the 1st, 2015. I'm really looking forward to this book. I always knew Jonathan had one in him, and I want to certainly have him on to talk about it, not just because it's a fascinating subject, because Churchill did have this sense of destiny about him. It was really something. We talked about writing letters. He wrote a letter to his mother, and he said, oh, I was under fire today for the first time. He was 21, I guess, or whatever he was in Cuba. How did you spend your birthday, son? And he's that's when he said there's nothing more exhilarating than being shot at without result. But he was shot, and she was all worried about him when she wrote him back. And he said, no, no, God couldn't have created such a magnificent creature as me, or <laughs> however he talked about himself, so typically modest, but tongue-in-cheek, too. And he said, and just let me die in such a pedestrian way as being shot. So he, But he really believed it as much as that was bravado, and he really was was that confident. He felt he had a great purpose in life, and he carried that all the way through the war. Uh, He said, I felt every moment of my life before that led up to this moment where he had to take on this incredible burden. And there's written records of the time that he felt he was going to be called on someday to save the empire. It sounds impossible to believe, as many things do, about some of these really big figures in history, but it was true. And I think that this book, God and Churchill, will just tell us sort of his view of that immense pressure that he felt and just this sense of destiny, which is can be good or bad. Um, Charlie Guiteau, we talked about, had a sense of destiny too. He thought he was supposed to be the ambassador to France and he shot a president for it. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, Churchill is someone uh, who's just endlessly fascinating, I think. And the reason there are so many books about him and more on the way is that people are continue to want to learn about him and get inside his mind and understand his perspectives and viewpoints on things and how he lived. Very similar to here in the U.S., uh, Abraham Lincoln. He's just such a fascinating, pivotal person in not just the respective country's history, but in world history as well. By the way, I want to encourage people to ask about writing and publishing. As the show gets up and running, you can tweet your questions to at History Dean, shoot an email to author at historyauthor.com. You can also like the show page on Facebook at facebook.com slash history author. Now, the next writer I'd like to introduce is Barry Strauss. His latest book is The Death of Caesar, and I was really fascinated by this question. He was asked, what do readers ask him the most? And this is his response. The question I get the most often from my readers is, did it really happen? They tend to look at ancient history as fiction, and they can't believe that stories like Spartacus could really have taken place. And so I answer, yes, it really did happen, and then I try to tell them how we know that it really happened, what kind of evidence we have, How can we trust the evidence? What kind of probing questions do we 
subject the evidence to and, and, and how do we come out with uh, the reality about something that took place thousands of years ago. This website you gave me was really great and I wanted to give it a shout out. Classicalwisdom.com. It's Classical Wisdom Weekly. They run the subhead Ancient Wisdom for Modern Minds. I could lose hours just scrolling through that. That's so big right now, I think, that period. Absolutely. Ancient civilizations like Greece and Rome, people find a lot of knowledge and comfort there in that era. There are a lot of parallels between now and then, and we can see them evident in a lot of different aspects of modern society and politics. There's so many lessons from Rome, from Greece, and how clearly they can be translated and applied to our own situations now. And uh, not only is Classical Wisdom Weekly give you some ancient wisdom to really ponder upon, but it's also a fun site. There's a lot of nutritional info there, so uh, I do hope people will, will check it out. We look forward to these books on the Big Apple, Science, Covered Wagons, and Statesmen. One other topic you'll hear, baseball. Right around the corner here was Two Shores, where, of course, legends like Babe Ruth and Jackie Gleason and Joe DiMaggio all hung out. It's now a Chase Bank, but <laughs> there is a plaque. The author is Jim Leake, whose latest book is Nine Innings for the King, the day wartime London stopped for baseball, July 4, 1918. On a sunny 4th of July during World War I, King George V went out to a ball game. Along with Queen Mary and other royalty, Winston Churchill, dozens of VIPs, thousands of troops and ordinary Londoners, the monarch chaired an extraordinary baseball match between American soldiers and sailors. This historic event helped solidify the transatlantic alliance that was vital to winning the war. The game itself was a thriller reported throughout the English-speaking world. The players ranged from kids fresh off the sandlots to a handful of major and minor leaguers and a future Hall of Famer. The two veteran pitchers went the distance, the outcome in doubt until the last batter. Drawing on American and British sources and game day coverage, this first ever full account of The King's Game records every play and explores the lives of several players. It also provides a brief history of the Anglo-American Baseball League and Armed Forces Baseball played in England, France, and the United States during the Great War. Jim is a contributor to the Sabre Baseball Biography Project and the creative director of Taillight Communications. Nine Innings for the King came out last April from the folks at McFarlane and Company, publishers of academic and nonfiction books. One thing about baseball is people really seem to love to read about its history because it goes back so far, much more than other sports. Yeah, I think baseball is so intertwined with uh, American history and it is our national pastime. And especially now it's been adopted all over the world. There are very competitive leagues throughout Asia and uh, in the island nations in the Caribbean and Central America, Latin America, uh, very popular as well. One baseball book that I'm absolutely loving is Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty by Charles Learson, who was formerly a Sports Illustrated executive. It's a wonderful biography, whether you're into baseball or not, but it's about an American legend whose reputation has been tarnished over the years. We hear so many horror stories about Ty Cobb that uh, he's almost this mythical villain at this point, but Charlie really digs deep into the archives and really does Ty Cobb Justice gives him the biography he deserves, and he is also a Sabre baseball biography winner as well. Baseball is not my number one sport, but I like, for some reason, read a biography every now and then of one of these great old players because you do get a flavor for the city and the time that they played in. And the National Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City is one of the best museums of any kind just because there's so much character in it and you look at your soft life by comparison mm -hmm. speaking of no air conditionings the, imagine the buses those guys traveled on never mind all the racial discrimination they, they had that whole other level ladled on top of them but they just wanted to play and it, that's something that i really like about baseball books or sports books in general jerry rice whoever it happens to be well it's one two three fight you out at the old ball game Okay, well, that's the first few pages, so to speak, of what the History Author Show is going to be all about. If you can't wait to read the books you've heard about on today's episode, visit us at historyauthor.com. And if you want to buy the books, please use the Amazon links we provide on our site. 
Stephen Bedford, thank you again for helping me kick off the show and for pointing so many great books our way and just sitting around here in Midtown as the sun goes down and talking about books. Again, this is a teaser show. Now you'll see the RSS feed up. Our Google ranking will start to climb and you'll be able to like us at facebook.com slash history author. There's so much more to come, so many more great book journeys for us to take together. And we hope you'll join the History Author Show for the ride. Thank you again for, for hosting me. It's an honor to be sort of the guinea pig for this exciting new <laughs> initiative. And it really is going to be an exciting ride. I think uh, there's so many different ways to enjoy history and to learn things. Uh, it doesn't just have to be in a classroom anymore. For example, you could listen to this podcast on your morning commute. So excited to just bring history and a lot of great authors to you in a new way, a new fashion. Well, I will not lose your phone number, that's for sure, and see what you have going on because you're, as I said, just up the street. And remember, again, you can follow Stephen at Simon Books on Twitter. Follow me at History Dean. And we hope you'll join us next time. We hope you'll give us some feedback on what you think, liked it, hated it, think we need to change things, think I should add some cat sounds in maybe when I, <laughs> I talk about cats. Well, I, I know the answer to that one. So, <laughs> Oh, people love cats. Come on. That'd be perfect the cat co-host next time <laughs> anyway until then while we work on things like a cat co-host thank you for listening everybody and happy reading on the east side west side things ain't like before there are tears in the eyes of the regular guys oh new york ain't new york anymore 